Wright addressed the court showing no remorse. I just want to tell y'all, I'll be home soon. I'll be Keon. I love my family. June 2017, during a trial for the murder of Jordan Klee, Dancer Wright was seen with a disrespectful attitude as he smiled without remorse for the crime he had committed. But the consequences changed the course of his life forever. Here are 10 dangerous teens reacting to life sentences. Number 10. Dancer Wright when talking about shocking reactions to life sentences from the list of teenage killers, only a small few come close to the petrifying mocking smiles and lackadaisical attitude of Danta Wright, who at the time appeared before the Washtenaw Trial Court in Ann Arbor, Michigan, after hideously murdering Jordan Klee. Being one of the best football players at his level, Jordan Klee was a senior at Pioneer High School and was well loved by everybody. He had his whole life ahead of him, but his dream of attending Michigan University and joining their football squad was short-lived. On October 4th, 2016, Klee was found dead with a single gunshot wound to the head. His death sent shivers down the spine of the entire community, as it was the very first homicide of the entire year. Everyone wondered what an innocent young man would have done to merit such a gruesome death, and of course, who could his killer be? Now, after his death was ruled as a homicide, there was a meticulous investigation. A piece of information led to the arrest of three main suspects connected to Clee's death. Danta Wright, Delrano Gracie, and Jermarius Ellison, who were all teenagers at the time. In June 2017, several months after the death of Jordan Klee, to avoid a pre-trial hearing for the case, Danta casually admitted to killing Klee with the help of his friends. He explained that he and his friends robbed Klee at gunpoint, and when they found no money on him, he was shot. Klee's mother wept bitterly as she learned what happened to her son through Danta's confession. Throughout the trial, Danta didn't exhibit any sign of remorse. Even after meeting with the victim's family, Danta was extremely disrespectful, smiling, and nearly laughing as one of the victim's family members read an impact statement before the court. Whatever it was that you felt you needed more than his life, your why will never be better than his life. Your want will never trump my son's death. Afterward, 17-year-old Wright addressed the court saying, I just want to tell you I'll be home soon. I love my family. The judge expressed his disdain for Wright's attitude and asked the prosecutors if the sentencing agreement was too lenient. He threatened to reject the agreement due to Wright's horrific behavior in court. And during a brief recess, the victim's family requested that the case not go to trial, expressing their desire to move forward. Following the break, Wright's lawyer apologized on behalf of the teenager, attributing his actions to emotional challenges and explaining that, for some, a display of fear may manifest as a smile. Judge David Schwartz gave Wright 23 to 50 years in prison for the gruesome murder of 18-year-old Jordan Klee. Let's see if he smiles in prison. Number 9. Jennifer Ann Me. From a supposed reality star to a convicted murderer, Jennifer Me, aka The Hiccup Girl, appeared on national TV shows like NBC's Today Show many times. Due to her extremely long-lasting hiccups, it must have been a bit of a shock to many to see her being arrested for first-degree murder after she staged the robbery and eventual death of Shannon Griffin. Born July 28, 1991, in St. Petersburg, Florida, Me was an outstanding young girl. In 2007, while she was barely 15 years old, her uncontrollable hiccups paved the way for her international fame. She was seen on TV all over the U.S. with the hope of finding a cure. It was in the process that she got the name Hiccup Girl where she claimed she could hiccup for a whopping 50 times per minute. While the causes and treatment of her condition were disputed, her popularity as an internet sensation was long-lasting. The hiccups eventually went away after treatment from Dr. Bob Lind. Even after treatment, she continued gaining media attention. but not for the right reasons. In June 2007, she ran away from home, and it was reported in the papers. From there, things spiraled out of control. The genesis of her problems stemmed from dating a man named Lamont Newton when she was just 18. Now she would recruit Laron Rayford, and coupled with Newton, they would help her rob people online. 
In October 2010, Mi met up with a 22-year-old guy she met online, Shannon Griffin. She invited him to a vacant home, leading him to the back of the house, where her two friends were waiting with a 38 caliber handgun in ambush. The victim was shot four times, after which they robbed him of less than $50, leaving him to die from those wounds. Arresting him was relatively easy because they were all living together. They were then arrested a few hours after Griffin's body was found. Now, during her trial, one of the many defenses used by her lawyer, John Traverna, was that Mee's hiccups were a symptom of Tourette syndrome. Mee was eventually denied bail and remanded in prison. On September 20th, 2013, Mee was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. On hearing that sentence, the look on her face was that of someone hit with a stone of reality, that her life had taken the wrong turn while she cried out without limits up until she left the courtroom. Her sentence was criticized in an article in the Hastings Women's Law Journal as purportedly different from that which would be imposed upon a similarly situated male. Number 8. Nicholas Lindsay February 21, 2011, Officer David Crawford, 46, was responding to a call of a suspicious person near Tropicana Field late that night. Now, the caller stated there was a man holding a brick in his backyard and then jumped the fence. The caller thought he might be a burglar, but in reality, it was Nicholas Lindsay. Born January 18, 1995, in Florida, Nicholas Lindsay is a man who we know is convicted of murder in the first degree of a law enforcement officer from the St. Petersburg Police Department, Officer David Crawford. According to records, Lindsay was known to have a prior record for nonviolent crimes like grand theft and trespassing. Although he attended school on the day of the shooting, he had already missed 40 days during the year. Gibbs High School's former principal, Kevin Gordon, spoke with Lindsay about cutting class. The principal and his reading intervention teacher said the teenager always respected authority. Karen Morris, one of the teachers, stated he was a typical teen who would strive for the teacher's attention to do his best. Off campus, Lindsay appeared to be much different. His Facebook page showed his gang name. St. Petersburg Mayor Bill Foster recognized Lindsay when he saw the mugshot. He met with the teen inside his home during a 2010 outreach for the community event. It was after his first arrest for grand theft. Foster said the teen impressed him the most and had a goal to succeed in life. But after the incident, Foster went on to say that he wanted Lindsay to be tried as an adult. Later, on the night of the hideous crime, Officer Crawford arrived at the area, spotted the person, and got out of the vehicle. At exactly 10.37 p.m., fellow officer Donald J. Ziegler noticed what was happening and reported an exchange of fire. Ziegler found Crawford lying beside his cruiser. He sustained multiple gunshot wounds at proximity when he reached for a notepad. There was a massive manhunt for the suspect of more than 200 officers from different agencies across Tampa Bay. The manhunt would come to an end, and 16-year-old Nicholas Lindsay would be arrested. He eventually confessed to the police. March 7, 2011, Lindsay was indicted by a grand jury on a murder in the first-degree charge. He was moved to the Pinellas County Jail, where he was put with other juveniles who were also facing adult charges at that time. On March 23, 2012, Lindsay was convicted of Crawford's murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. It would be his age that helped him escape the death penalty. In October 2013, Lindsay's life sentence was eventually upheld after an appeal. On hearing the sentence, Lindsay shocked everyone with his petrifying grin. But Lindsay actually grinned when the judge read his ruling, the lack of remorse not lost on David Crawford's daughter, Amanda. With his lack of remorse, Crawford's daughter, Amanda, called out Lindsay's action in the courtroom as she was happy that justice was being served. Number 7. Dylan Shoemaker on March 19, 2013, Ashley Smith was at work, and her boyfriend Dylan Shoemaker was looking after her two children. Upon her return, she discovered that her older child, Austin Smith, had been brutally murdered. 16-year-old Dylan Shoemaker was living in Springville, New York at the time of the murder. He lived with his mother and Ashley Smith, his girlfriend, along with her two sons, whom he wasn't related to. On the day of the incident, Dylan was taking care of his girlfriend's two young sons while she was working at the restaurant. And when the night came to an end, one of her sons was found dead. 
and Shoemaker was immediately arrested for killing him. It was eventually discovered that he had beaten Austin severely, and sadly, Austin didn't survive. On December 9th, 2013, 17-year-old Dylan tearfully apologized to his 19-year-old girlfriend in the courtroom in Buffalo saying that he never wanted to hurt Austin and definitely didn't want him to die. The jurors who found him guilty of second-degree murder didn't believe his apology. State Supreme Court Justice M. William Bowler didn't believe it as well. He gave Dylan Shoemaker the max sentence of 25 to life in prison. Now, During that trial, Dylan admitted to hitting Austin because he was crying and disturbing his baby brother. He claimed to have put a pillow on his head and punched it until he stopped crying. The judge expressed immense doubt about Dylan's claim that he did didn't intend to kill Austin, or even realize the consequences of his actions, as he referred to a phone conversation Dylan had with his mother while awaiting trial. In that conversation, Shoemaker said that he could use his age and appearance as a white man to gain sympathy from the jury. Austin's grandfather, Michael Smith, told the judge that their family's life was destroyed because this tragedy didn't have to happen. He pleaded with the judge to consider their feelings in sentencing Dylan Shoemaker. Shoemaker's attorney argued that Dylan was ill-equipped equipped to take care of the children due to his tough childhood and anger issues. But there were other dynamics at work there, including my client's inability to either control his anger or frustration and his inexperience in babysitting. The judge inquired from the defense attorney about the potential risk to the community if Dylan were to be released after serving a 15-year sentence. Dylan Shoemaker turned to Ashley Smith, his girlfriend, and with a waterfall flowing from his eyes, he apologized again and again, expressing his love for Austin and his regrets for what happened. He acknowledged his troubled family life, but thanked his family for their support. <laughs> I didn't mean to kill Austin. Ashley, I really did it. I really think I did it. I didn't mean to hurt him. Dylan Shoemaker continued to weep as he was taken into court for sentencing. Shoemaker was given 25 years to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Number 6. Alyssa Bustamante on October 21st, 2009, Bustamante killed Elizabeth Alton in an excruciating way, disturbing to humanity. In 2002, Bustamante's grandparents, Gary and Karen Brooke, took legal custody of her and her three younger siblings, since her mother Michelle had addiction issues and her father Caesar was serving time in prison. Friends started noticing changes in Alyssa around 2007, when she was hospitalized after a suicide attempt. On her YouTube profile, she listed cutting under her hobbies. She would post a picture on social media holding two fingers to her head pretending to shoot herself. Alton lived four houses down from Bustamante. On the day of the crime, Alyssa convinced her younger sister to bring Alton to the forest by their homes to hang out. Upon her arrival, Bustamante strangled her, slit her throat like she was an animal, and stabbed her eight times consecutively in the chest. She then buried her body in a grave that she had dug five days before in the woods behind her house and covered the grave with leaves. She killed this poor girl due to homicidal ideation just to see what it was like to kill someone. And after that murder, she would go to her journal and write, I just f***ing killed someone. I strangled them and then slit their throat and stabbed them and now they're dead. I don't know how to feel at the moment. It was amazing. As soon as you get over the, oh my God, I can't do this feeling, it's pretty enjoyable. I'm kind of nervous and shaky right now though. <laughs> Okay, gotta go to church now, lol. The worst part is, she went to attend a church dance while the police looked for Alton. November 17th, 2009, after Bustamante was arrested, she first appeared in court where she pleaded not guilty and was indicted for first-degree murder and armed criminal action. This was due to the knife she used. In January 2012, she took a plea deal to get lesser charges of second-degree murder and armed criminal action. She was eventually sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of conditional release in 2024 for second-degree murder and a consecutive sentence of 30 years for armed criminal action. Through her trial and sentencing, Bustamante remained stoned face without flinching. You and your lawyers knew that they could uh, uh, present evidence and argue for the punishment that you all thought was appropriate. Yes. And that the state could present evidence and argue for the punishment that the state thought was appropriate. Yes. She tried to appeal the case in March 2014, but it was denied. Number 5. Brandon Spencer 
Even though he wasn't a teenager during his sentencing, Brandon was 19 when he committed the crime that led him to be sentenced to 40 years to life in prison. Now, he grew up in Inglewood, where guns were plentiful and warring gangs battled openly. His life before the crime was filled with circumstantial events, like in the year 2011, when he was shot in the stomach outside an Inglewood restaurant, and the culprit was never apprehended. In 2012, Brandon walked into this Halloween party at the University of Southern California and just opened fire. It was great that no one was killed, but four people were seriously injured, and the incident caused uproar in the school. He was charged with four counts of attempted murder. Throughout his hearing in 2014, he was utterly distraught as he was seen crying and rocking in his chair. When he addressed the court, he said, I'm sorry for what happened, Your Honor, but I can't do life in prison. The prosecution relied on the fact that Spencer was a gangbanger and that the attack was enkindled after he saw a member of an affiliated gang at that party. Police contended this was payback for the time he was shot back in 2011. Evidence was produced against him, which included a long sheet of offenses. On hearing it, Spencer said, I'm not a bad person, but I've made mistakes, and I'm not the gangbanger that you try to portray me as. He also maintained his innocence throughout the trial. As the judge read on, deputies had to restrain him as he banged his head against the table. Section 12022.53b, this is to be concurrent with the principal term. Four. Even though three people at the party identified him as the shooter, many others believe in him and his innocence. There are even petitions and social media campaigns out there calling for his release from prison. Number 4. Mackenzie Shirilla July 31st, 2022, Mackenzie Shirilla earned the name Hell on Wheels as she accelerated her Toyota Camry into the Plitco Building, a large building at the intersection of Progress and Almadea Drives in Strongsville, crashing and instantly killing her boyfriend Dominic Russo and his friend Davian Flanagan. Now, a month before this, Shirilla allegedly made multiple threats toward Russo. Videos recovered from his phone revealed an altercation in which she was heard repeatedly degrading Dominic, threatening him, and damaging his property. She threatened to key his car and break the handle off the door after he refused to let her into his home. Two weeks before the incident, she allegedly threatened to crash her vehicle when she was driving with Russo because she was upset over a disagreement they had. Russo called his mother and asked to be picked up, and a friend ended up retrieving him. In a phone call with Russo, the friend allegedly overheard Shirilla say, I'll crash this car right now. Now, the love they once shared had fizzled out, and Russo decided it was time to call it quits. For Shirilla, she decided that death was the only way out of this relationship, as she considered Russo as hers. After the crash, police arrived at the scene around 45 minutes later. Russo and Flanagan were both pronounced dead at the scene. Shirilla miraculously survived and was hospitalized, but during the investigation, she asked if they could just suspend her license for 10 years. It's really hard for people to fathom how someone could be concerned with their driving privileges, having just been responsible for the deaths of two people. Now, during the trial, she continued to maintain her innocence, claiming that she had no recollection of what led to that crash. However, the prosecution showed her TikTok Halloween videos right after she got out of the hospital. This was right after she had attended a concert in a wheelchair, pretty much signaling the lack of remorse for what she had done. Prosecutors also went through the problematic relationship she had with Russo, and this was used to provide more evidence against her. The video evidence here was pivotal and helping the judge reach a verdict during the August 14th, 2023 sentencing. As the judge read out her pre-sentencing speech, Shirilla began crying uncontrollably as she could envision where this was headed. Specifically, she chose a date just before her 18th birthday. She chose to drive the car, the time to drive the car. She chose an obscure, previously scouted route through the industrial parkway. Before reading that verdict, the judge said that Shirilla was literal hell on wheels, saying she intentionally drove at an hour where not many witnesses would be around, on a path that she didn't routinely use but had visited just days before. Cuyahoga County Common Pleas Judge Nancy Margaret Russo, who has no relations with Dominic Russo, rounded up by saying, She had a mission, and she executed it with precision. The mission was death. She added the death of these two victims wasn't a result of reckless driving but was premeditated murder. Shirilla was found guilty of killing both Dominic and Davian and was subsequently sentenced to two concurrent sentences of 15 years to life. As she was handcuffed and let out of court, she wept without control. 
Number 3. Martise Fuller On May 19, 2021, Martise Fuller showed no remorse or concern when he got a life sentence for the brutal murder of his ex-girlfriend from high school. Gailey Juga, his ex-girlfriend, lived with her parents in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Now, she was a popular cheerleader and honors student at Bradford High School. She had aspirations to enroll in college and eventually follow a path in the medical field. On the contrary, Fuller, who was only 15 years old then, went to that same school as her and played as a quarterback on the football team. It could be a twisted Romeo and Juliet high school story, where Juliet really never expected to be killed by Romeo for a reason that shocked everyone. Marti started exerting force over Kaylee, and the situation escalated into violence. He would subject her to both sexual and physical assault. After being together for only 10 months, Kaylee reached a breaking point and chose to terminate that toxic relationship. How could she know what was coming her way? Martise became her shadow, stalking her at work and school. And even though she begged him to stop, the situation would break him further. She ran out of options on what to do about this guy. Kaylee reported him to school authorities, and Fuller was rusticated. This is where Fuller went mad. He just lost everything. His education, the love of his life, and even respect on social media. So now with a feeling of nothing to lose, he started thinking of how to kill Kaylee. On May 9th, 2019, Kaylee and her mom, Stephanie Juga, 39 years old, were at their residence. Kaylee had just started to regain a sense of security following many months of harassment and stalking by Fuller. She was listening to music in her room, and her mother was doing chores. Meanwhile, Fuller, conspiring with a friend to be dropped off 10 blocks away from her residence, would proceed towards her front porch by riding his bicycle. Then he would sneak into the residence through an open garage and proceed directly to her room. Upon entering, he swiftly drew his firearm and ruthlessly shot her five times. All Kaylee's mother heard was a scream from her daughter followed by gunshots. She rushed to see what was going on but met Fuller standing in the doorway with his gun pointed toward her. She begged him not to shoot, but he did, firing shots that hit her in the arm as she scrambled to lock herself in a closet. When she was able to, she called 911 while Fuller fled the scene. At 3 p.m. on the day, Fuller gave himself up by disclosing the crime to his cousin, who had happened to be a federal attorney. He was arrested and charged with first-degree intentional homicide, attempted first-degree intentional homicide, and burglary while armed with a dangerous weapon. Kaylee was declared dead at the scene, whereas her mother survived. She had a few donations from people to foot the medical bill. During his sentencing, Fuller displayed a lack of emotion and was even looking drowsy. The now 18-year-old Martise Fuller sat emotionless. However, later in the same year, Martise was convicted and faced charges as an adult. At the age of 17, he was given life in prison without the possibility of parole. Number 2. Anthony David Parga October 29, 2006, Lee Lil Washington, an African-American Cal State Fullerton student, went to a Halloween house party organized by the West Side La Abra gang alongside his friends. Now, despite the fact that the party was organized by the gang, we want you to know that Washington and other certain individuals in attendance had no affiliation with any gang. Now, While at this party, a disagreement and fight erupted between two women inside the house. Consequently, Washington and his friends were instructed to exit the party. Nevertheless, they came back when the situation appeared to have settled down, a move that David Anthony Parga received as a sign of disrespect to his gang. Following this, Parga went on to meet Washington, who was outside the house and hadn't participated in the argument or squabbling. Sadly, Parga lethally fired four shots from a 22 caliber pistol, resulting in Washington's tragic demise. After the shooting, Parga directed Washington's friends to move him away from the residence and cautioned them against calling 911. However, they opted to take Washington to a nearby police station just a few blocks away, and from there he was conveyed to a hospital, but regrettably succumbed to internal bleeding. Later on, David was apprehended as his DNA was discovered on a shell casing at the site of the shooting. Furthermore, a female witness gave testimony that she had assisted in getting rid of Parga's bloodstained clothes. It's crucial to highlight that at the time of his unfortunate death, Washington was on the verge of completing a double major in business administration and accounting. 
Being just a semester away from graduation, Parga sadly thwarted that dream. Eight years following the incident, Parga would face trial. He made an ill-advised decision, opting to represent himself in court, which ultimately worked to his detriment. The presiding judge before delivering the sentence described Parga's actions as a senseless and extremely foolish killing of a man with a promising future. After the sentence was announced, Parga specifically turned to Washington's mother to apologize, as he believed she didn't harbor ill will toward him, unlike the rest of the family. I know there's nothing I could do to bring this guy's son back, brother back, but I am, I am deeply sorry for what happened to him. And number one, Lee Rios. In February 2018, two members in Texas were convicted for the murder of a man from Metro Atlanta. The incident represented yet another narrative of a senseless and irrational murder. And the unfolding events began on May 1st, 2017, when Vincente Cruz, a 44-year-old Austell resident, mysteriously disappeared after a Craigslist meeting related to his car. The information about his unidentified whereabouts circulated on the same day, and concerns grew as time elapsed. Eventually, on May 22, 2017, authorities discovered Cruz's lifeless body hidden in the bushes. At that point, everyone wanted to know what happened to Mr. Cruz. Following months of thorough investigation, the FBI revealed that Gilbert George Moran had a connection to Cruz's death. Additionally, they discovered that another individual, Lee Rios, was also linked to the murder. We would then find out that Rios had killed Cruz because of a drug deal gone wrong. Throughout the course of their meeting, Cruz had initially brought a friend along. However, he later told the friend to leave, saying that the prospective buyer, identified as Lee Rios, required some time to examine the truck. He assured that he would contact her afterward, but that call never came. The vehicle that had gone missing was eventually located, abandoned, in a motel parking lot, accompanied by the unsettling revelation of blood inside, identified as Cruz's blood. Rios decided not to disclose information on what happened on that day, specifically the reasons behind why he killed Cruz, but it was certain that he would spend the rest of his life behind bars. Throughout his sentencing, he maintained a stoic expression, revealing no emotional cues. After his sentence was read out, he cooperated with deputies and walked out of the courtroom.